Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's episode of the Mastering Retention Podcast. I'm Tom Hammond, uh, your host and co-founder of UserWise. Today, I am joined by Sam Abbott, um, who is currently head of monetization at Rec Room, um, which will be fun to dig into a little bit. Um, but uh, before we do that, you know, Sam, I always like to ask, you know, what's your story? Like, how did you get into games? Working at Rec Room. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm definitely excited to be here. I, uh, my, my journey into games. I worked in finance very briefly after college, as I think uh, a lot of people did. Um, it was sort of right around the time of the financial crisis. Um, I thought I had sort of made it through by the skin of my teeth, but sort of a year in, I realized it, it re really wasn't for me. Um, I had a friend who had just gotten a job at Playdom, which is a social games company that had been acquired by Disney. Uh, many years ago. And I, I called him asking about, hey, you know, these are my skills. What do you think? Do I have a shot? You know, this was sort of at the time that social games was exploding and there was this huge need for um, data-driven thinking. And I knew how to work a spreadsheet and I sort of found my way in the door as a data analyst. I, I started at EA, one thing led to another, and I ended up getting a job at another social games company, Playfish, that had been acquired yeah. by EA. Um, Playfish sort of merged into the mothership pretty quickly after I joined. And I sort of hung around in various capacities, you know, data science, data analytics, uh, product management, a little bit of production at EA over the course of about nine years. Um, and I, I got to do a lot of different things um, there. And then basically that turned into a two year gig at Scopely where I really kind of wanted to hone my craft and go deep on product and, and work with just the best people in the world. And yeah. uh, then basically, you know, I, I think there's, been a lot of changes and a lot of emerging new business models and obviously UGC and the rise of that has been the one that speaks to me in the most interesting way and so uh, opportunity at Rec Room came along uh, a little over two years after that and uh, it just seemed impossible to skip out on and I ended up getting it and here I am so that's 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 basically my story. So for folks that aren't aware of what Rec Room is like what is it what do you guys do? Yeah, so Rec Room is um, a mass market, you know, set of virtual worlds, games, and experiences that is uh, mostly powered by user-generated content. Um, it started as a VR app, but it is a, you know, what we call a radically cross-platform uh, social app. And the idea is that you have your avatar and you have your private space, but um, it is sort of this universe of worlds and experiences, and there's all kinds of content that you can collect and wear and have fun, and it's, it's deeply social. And so what started as, you know, a VR hangout space has turned into like a, a sort of massively cross-platform experience that pretty much anywhere you go, you can sort of experience all different kinds of, you know, rooms and, and you know, experiences and content. So that, that, that's, that's basically, I think, Rec Room in a nutshell. Yeah. How different is it from, say, Roblox? Well, I think I think obviously, you know, both Rec Room and Roblox are powered by user generated content. I think right. that Rec Room has in it the DNA of uh, a VR app, and, and not that it's VR specific. I think you know, Rec Room is very strong on console and is growing really fast on mobile. But I would say the biggest difference is that at in Rec Room you have a really really deep attachment to your own avatar and your own space. And that basically like it does not, Rec Room does not exist solely for the purposes of that avatar and your quote unquote metagame experience, but it mm. also doesn't solely exist for the purposes of your relationship with the experiences you have in Rec Room, right? That you, there's a lot more channel surfing, I, I think, than I think that is probably the easiest way to differentiate between the two. But uh, there's probably lots of other differences, but that, that, that's sort of the one that I use as a, a good understanding of, you know, how, where we can get better, um, where we can learn from Roblox, stuff like that. That's great. So, you know, Sam, one thing that I noticed, you know, as I was, you know, getting ready for this conversation, you actually got your degree in economics from Harvard, which, you know, first off means you're probably much, much smarter than me. Um, but uh, secondly, I was curious, you know, I didn't see game economists, you know, no. in any of your history. Have you ever done any sort of like game economy stuff? Um, you know, I, I think of myself as a bad system designer. Yeah, I think that basically, you know, as a, as a data analyst and as a product manager, you have to think about systems design. I think that the strength of your ability to manage the KPIs of a live game is only as strong as the strength of your foundational system. And 
That foundational system, in my opinion, is comprised of two things, one of which I have zero skill at, one of which I have a little bit of skill at, right? And the zero skill is understanding what makes for a visceral moment-to-moment -moment fun experience, and then what is the infrastructure that you build around that visceral moment-to-moment -moment experience. And that's where system design comes in. That's where game economy design comes in. Like I said, I, I really sort of started from my ability to hang out in Excel and do lots of modeling. And I, I just sort of picked yeah. it up from there. And I, I, early in my career, I got to work with some of the smartest people like ever at, at game economy design. So I, I just kind of stole from them. <laughs> I love it. Um, cool. So I know you've worked on probably one of the biggest mobile games ever, which is uh, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. Yeah. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to talk today about, I want to say, kind of play to win mechanics. I'm curious, like, do you think that Galaxy of Heroes has elements of pay to win? You know, I, I, I'm biased. I love, I still love Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. I <laughs> stopping playing it was harder than leaving EA. And I was at EA for almost a decade and that was pretty hard. Um, so I think when I think about pay to win or how people perceive pay to win or talk about it, it seems like a negative, right? And so I, I think the answer, the short answer to your question is yes, in that basically like people will spend money for virtual currency that they can use to gain power for their characters at a rate that is faster than the competition. And they can use that to eke out wins. And so it's a few steps removed. I don't believe it sabotages the experience for people who don't pay. Um, and, but I mean, yeah, I think technically speaking, I would be remiss if I didn't call that pay to win. So I, I do think that those elements are there, but um, it's, you know, I think it's important to sort of say that like, I, I, I'd love to use that term devoid of the connotations that like that's evil or that sucks for everybody else. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally that's, that is a big part of how the system works. Well, and I, I, I do think some players actually love the pay to win mechanics. So um, yeah, um, but I, I'm curious, um, Historically, gamers hate pay to win, you know, yeah. mechanics and stuff. Um, and so you've got, you know, companies like Riot, you know, with League of Legends, mm -hmm. completely against the, the pay to win mechanics and stuff. And I'm curious, like, are there any ways that you can utilize combat balancing to, you know, kind of have a sustainable monetization scheme, but not completely lean into the, the pay to win mechanics that is going to sour your player base. What's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I mean, I, you know, you can't have like, in my opinion, like you can't have a really effective, sustainable combat based game without the combat being able to stand on its own two feet where the strategic decisions that you make and the investment choices that you make in terms of what you're going after, whether you're grinding or paying for it, that these are like, these are sort of foundational elements that no swipe of the credit card should be able to undo. What I, what I really think the most interesting, like kind of front, because, you know, obviously we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this and we spent a lot of time looking at our data and, and responding to the community in terms of how they felt about what direction the game was going in. Spoiler alert, a lot of the times people were upset. And I think, you know, the working through those problems and trying to do it sustainably, I think one of the the, the frontiers um, that we reached working on that game was that, you know, players understood our systems as well or better than we did. And a big part of what we had to do was come up with um, a good use of their time. Um, and if that meant sort of combat balancing decisions that sort of obfuscated pay to win choices or went against quote unquote pay to win choices. Like those were the decisions that we would make because the most valuable resource that we had was the player's time. Um, mm. And so just to zoom in on that, right? Like um, you could be operating and this is like, this is once you nail like the foundations of how to balance the economy and all this sure. other stuff, like yeah. a lot of this doesn't hold up. But if, if you, if you manage to sort of get out of that sort of if you manage to move up the hierarchy of needs where you're really thinking about how can we create the best game possible while sort of sustaining our business, you can break down how a player spends their time in a way that says, I might not be making money off of this player right now, um, but anytime I want to, I can. And that basically their engagement with the system is really about 
is are we as the developers matching the maximum amount that a player is willing to pay and not going over that and sort of sort of sabotaging their long-term relationship with the game. And so the reason why this goes back to combat balancing, just to zoom in that more, is that like I think that if you are running a top-end meta in a core or mid-core game and you're thinking about sort of the 12 degree rock, paper, scissors, you know, chain that you're putting together in order to create an interesting meta. Um, the easy answer, of course, is to just power creep and hard counter and power creep and hard counter. And basically the point is you can get away with doing that once, but the first time you disrespect your player's investment that they make in that, they're not going to be willing to go along with it again. And then basically, even if you can retain them, you're essentially like you've developed an unsustainable relationship with how you monetize them. So basically like stealing from the great games of the age that don't use pay to win tactics where you're basically trying to build out um, breadth of reasons to unlock this character, reasons to invest in this character, reasons to play in a different play style versus just reasons to win. You can pretend like it's good for your monetization, but the reality is that very often it's not, but it's good for your attention and your long-term sustainability. And I think basically what you wanna do is you wanna be making investments in interesting combat choices over time, whether or not they actually help grow your business or not, because if you can keep people around with that kind of novelty and engagement mm. and excitement and remixing of what the game is, then you have all kinds of opportunities to monetize at the most sustainable rate you can find. Yeah. Can't grow that ARPU curve if the players are churned. <laughs> you can't grow the ARPU curve if the players are churned. And you know what you also can't do is you, you can't like, you can't grow the ARPU curve bigger than it's going to be grown. You, and like, I know that's such a cliche, like a silly way to say it, but like, ultimately, like if you talk to players, some of them are very rational. Some of them are like, I know exactly what you're doing. I spend $20 a week because I enjoy logging in and I'm gonna do it forever. My, my father-in-law does that. He's basically, that was the conversation he, he had with me when I found out that he was a huge uh, Star Wars player, still is. And I, uh, the reality of the situation is that, you know, you you can't double that person's investment overnight just by power creeping. Or if you do, they're not going to be around in six months like this. Mm. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things you said in there that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, so you said it's important to match what a player is willing to pay and not going above that. Um, it kind of, as I'm thinking about that a little bit, like I could see a scenario where, um, you know, Johnny can spend $5 a month and Cindy can spend a hundred dollars a day and, you know, all sorts of variations in there. So I'm curious, like, do you have any examples of what that means to like actually do well, or like, have you seen it go terribly wrong or, or seen it go like really well? Like, I, I mean, I think I've definitely seen it go terribly wrong, right. That like, I, I can think of an instance in which like we've, and this is on Star Wars or this is on RPGs at Scopely where you you fundamentally sort of push the way you want to release a character at the end point of the meta. And you start to release that, like basically like, let's imagine, you know, I can't remember which character it was in Star Wars, but let's let's say it was, you know, Jango Fett or whatever, who I, I don't think it was him, but it was it was it was a pretty iconic character. And at the end of the day, you are looking at the distribution of how much your players are willing to spend in terms of money and time. And fundamentally, you come to the decision to say, I'm going to use these mechanics to push this price up a certain percentage. Uh, character's brand new. We know the character's very good. Um, like I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you can get away with that once you know, if you really need to, or you really want to. But if you've already done that before recently, where you sort of put like upset players expectations around, this is a new character. This is the hype cycle leading into this character. These are the things that we've teased that this character is going to be useful for. Um, then you come out with that character and the character cost is 20% higher or the amount of time that they have to invest in it is 20% lower before it goes away. Or the utility of that character is significantly lower than what their expectations were. The, 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 the pernicious reality is that you're going to sell that character to the vast majority of the audience you thought you were going to sell it to. And so you'll probably make some money. You know, let's, you'll charge a certain premium and you'll sell to slightly less of the population and you'll say, oh, great, our ARPU is up. And then you'll realize you converted, you know, 
a fraction of the people in all of the follow-up investment spend. Or the next time you release a character that comes even close to that price point, they're comparing it against that character. And so one persona is satisfied to the exclusion of all of the others. And then I, I think like, look, this, this happens. This is part of the, the, you know, the business. But like the thing that I am like, all, I, I try to use as a framework for, for managing this stuff is uh, what are we doing to maximize the percentage of the active elder player base that is deeply engaging with the economy and going after certain goals? So independent of how much they're spending, do I see people leaving the ecosystem of logging in, having healthy behaviors, being social, spending virtual currency, or, or you know, earning virtual currency? And I, I, I like, I think it's important to try to use that as a barometer um, in a way that's even more important than how much you know revenue you're making or what your what your character sales are. So I don't know if that answers the question, but like, I, I think basically it's like, in order to maximize revenue for different personas you have to go beyond pure revenue in order to make the most sustainable and long-term decisions. Yeah. So maybe slightly going off to that a little bit, like, is there a good way for me to figure out, like for your dad that he's willing to spend 20 bucks a week and that's it? Like, is it just a matter of tons of A-B testing or, or ways that I can segment it or ha like having all sorts of offers all over the time. Like yeah, I, I think that is the most scientific and foolproof way to do it. It's very labor intensive. You have to have a large audience in order to make it worthwhile. And your economy has to be built so that you can actually surface, test, and sell them things in that regard. But I, short answer is, yeah, that you sort of need a battery of tests and a battery of natural experiments to try to determine this is, there is slack in the system versus there is not slack in the system. Yeah. And then is it a matter of once I find and maybe group all of my players into yes. the segments of where they're at, is it a matter of now I should have someone on the team design a offer or something based on the amount that they want to spend and the frequency that they want to spend and, and kind of go through with that like that? Exactly. And, and this is where the fun part comes in, because I, I think that this is where the creativity comes in, where it's like, all right, we, we know the rough numbers. Um, we know what the, you know, th these numbers will generate in terms of how much revenue and how many people are involved and all this other stuff. Now, what's something cool that satisfies those criteria that you can make for the players? And this is both offers, but this is even features and game features. And I, I like, one of the common things I try to default to in this world, and, and even in my, my new world, is even if there's a lot of different ways to think about the experience that you're designing, a big part of your job you know, as a product manager is to sort of go into Terminator later, laser vision and say, all right, bottom line, what does this do for price times quantity? Um, this isn't the way that you should be designing. You should hand these things off to a designer who knows how to create a good experience and you know, speak for the player, but making sure you're validating your strategy by saying, you know, as long as these are the goals, let's satisfy those goals any way that you want. And that's that's usually the way that I, I would kick off a project like this, which is to say, here's roughly what we know about our spender behavior. Here's the kind of thing we've been talking about doing. You know, can the team square that circle? And if you can, then go nuts. Like be as creative as you want and push back and challenge. And that's how you end up with really, really good like designs of offers or features or interventions that still satisfy the business goals. That's awesome. I love it. Okay. One final question on this subject before we continue. Um, you mentioned, you know, ideally you want to avoid the, and I see this in like basically every RPG I've ever played, right? Which yes. is you power creep and then you counter it and you, you just keep going through that. Um, do you have any examples of how to not do that so people can kind of wrap their minds around it because I feel like the default thing is to do a power creep encounter. Yeah, I, you know, let me, I can give an example of, I'm not gonna be able to tell the whole story because it was a while ago. And you know, because all, all of my, my friends, you know, who were involved in like, we, we all worked really hard on this project. It was something that we were, we were proud of, but I, I think basically like, um, Thinking about the introduction, and this is very sort of a silly niche example from Star Wars, thinking about the introduction of Jedi uh, Master, uh, the Jedi version of Revan, right? The character from the Kataro character of Knights of the Old Republic. Mm -hmm. We just sort of to back it up strategically, like 
we knew that there was an 18 month gap between um, episode eight and episode nine um, of the Star Wars films. We knew that the sort of the, that new trilogy was integral to the success of that product when it launched. Um, and that basically episode eight comes out, we know that we don't actually have mainline Star Wars stuff to count on. And there was this large strategic conversation about what kind of content can we bring into the universe between episode eight and episode nine to keep people entertained and to give them long-term sustainable things to chase after. And you know the, the argument that I, not really an argument, the conversation that I would have with our live, the, who, the guy who's a live producer at the time, he and I basically, um, Nick Reinhardt is his name, he's awesome. And, and he and I would basically sort of go back and forth about like, if we're going to create a long-term chase for the game, we have to make sure that from a combat design perspective, that the chase reflects the investment. And that was that was sort of the default position for the project. That was something that he had been instituting with his team forever. And I would sort of tend to come to him and say, you know, you're right that that is the right framework. But let me show you what's happened in the data when we've broken those rules. When all of a sudden, some of the most powerful characters have been cheap, relatively speaking, mm -hmm. um, or have had a wide open funnel. Or let me show you when we've abided by this framework and then over time we've exhibited diminishing returns because it's really hard to do that without creating a character who just completely breaks the economy. And, you know, it, it, I, this is, obviously it was more complicated than this in terms of how we designed the character, how we iterated on the character, how we released the character. But, yep. you know, the idea was that breaking the pyramid of investment is too tempting from a business result, from even from an engagement result. Like, forget about money. Like, oh my God, I can get this character for free and then, you know, power them up. And this is so exciting. And now I'm going to spend a bunch of money on gear and I'm going to go to my guild. And there's, it's, it shakes up the meta. And, and, you know, this goes back to like one of my other like life lessons is that you always live long enough to see the long term consequences of like short term decision making. So, this was a situation in which I was tempted by, you know, what you get from breaking the pyramid and, Re, you know, Jedi Revan was a monster and it was really, really hard to unwind. And it was really, really hard to follow up to that character release with different strategies and ways of releasing new characters and engaging Star Wars fans without sort of sacrificing. And I, I'm sort of bastardizing the story of how it happened, but like that is a very good high level example of what happens yeah. when you, when you, you know, whatever the analogy is, when you, when you get tempted and you, you know, uh, and you succumb to that temptation and you, you can't do it because then you spend 18 months regretting your decision. It's like, that's, you know, yeah, that's, Love that's it. pretty much it. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, okay. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm curious uh, and something that I see a lot of product managers kind of wrestling with is I think ultimately anyone that's making games wants to make the best possible game for our players. Right. Um, and in, in a way, like we make free to play games. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make spending the best possible part. Like, you know, the game should be great, but it should be even more great, you know, after you spend money. Um, and I'm kind of curious, like, you know, and even tied within there, especially at larger companies, you have business goals, you know, quarterly revenue targets, engagement, mm -hmm. yeah, this, that, and the other. How do you context switch and balance between like, putting on your player experience lens, but also then switching back and, and having like the business KPIs and kind of keeping those things in balance. Because like, as you mentioned, sometimes you do want to do things for the player experience because it's going to keep the players around for longer. But at the same time, you also have these kind of business metrics that you have to kind of hit. So what's your process for switching between those two? Yeah, this is like, this is such a, this is like a, such a great and question. It's a question that everybody like thinks about all the time. Um, right. and, and I think uh, my preferred approach has, and I, this is something I've developed over time and I got wrong at first, and particularly coming to Rec Room and specifically sort of deciding to come to Rec Room and embrace, you know, a different way of approaching this than being so relentlessly, you know, monetization focused is the framework is this, right? It's, um, it's don't, a product manager, you know, should not enter uh, sort of the space or work with a game team with the idea of sort of um, succumbing to an idea of a gray area or, you know, a, a set of compromises that they're, they're willing to make from a clear vision. Um, 
my my preferred approach is that basically it is there is no like gray hat approach to thinking about your business goals. There is sort of the the things that you will do and the things that you will not do. And so it just to, just to sort of expand on that a little bit more. Um, if you have precision around what your principles are in terms of the ethics of running a business, that's also a gain experience. You put those principles above everything else, right? You put them above revenue and, you know, maybe you can't talk about that, you know, in that way, maybe that's not exciting for Wall Street to hear, but it, it kind of is because it provides clarity and certainty to say that, you know, at Rec Room, like one of the most important principles that, that we have is it's a small world. And it's, it's just, it's a really awesome, like, kanji that you can put on the wall and you can point to it and say, is this, are we violating this? And if we are, we're not doing it. And it doesn't matter, you know, how much money it makes. But I think that's very different from saying, we're going to find a way to do ethical monetization, or we're going to go to find a way to do sustainable monetization, or we're going to sand off the edges. It's like, no, like, for example, you know, changing the value proposition on something after selling it to a player is a violation of it's a small world. Um, I took your money and then I like that, that, that sort of decision is something that you, you really can't do. Uh, and if you do, you have to do the right thing by the player. However, um, you know, just as many people would argue that X price point is not fair. Um, yep. Each, I think with each team, it's different. Each company, it's different, but I don't want to live in a world where I'm trying to optimize the business and I, propose X and somebody says dark patterns and I propose Y and somebody says that's too expensive. Let's decide as a, as a group what our principles are. And if, if we are not violating our principles that we are willing to integrate this certain tactics into our overall monetization strategy. And I know that that's like hand wavy about some of the, the, the details of that, but like I always try to preach like precision is the name of the game here in terms of what it is that we believe is sustainable and ethical and what, the, what we believe is not. Yeah, that's great. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, and it, you know, you've had a lot of data science and analytics kind of background. So I'm kind of curious what the role of analytics can be in helping to paint a clearer picture around in-game activity. Um, specifically, like, I feel like we have so much data mm -hmm. sometimes now that it, it's just hard for me to like truly understand like what's actually going on in a game like what are players actually doing what's that experience I'm, I'm curious like what should the role of analytics be you know in that is it their role to go forward and to put together all these graphs and pictures and things like that or you know is it more of well, as a, a product manager or something, I should come forward with a question. And then I bring that to my analyst right. and say, here's my question. Can you help me figure out what the answer is? Interesting. You know, I, I actually, that, that, mo that second model is definitely something you can do. I, I actually love it when it's the other way around. Um, because I started as a data analyst and I spent, you know, like, this is going to sound dorky, you know, but like I spent a lot of my free time just looking at just being like, that is cool. Let me figure out how that, like, what is going on there? Like, are you, oh, wow. So at X player does this and it's an ocean and you can completely get lost and have analysis paralysis. And it's not good to just sort of fully embrace it full throttle. Right. But, but I did it anyway. Right. And, it's, and I think a lot of people do because it's so fascinating. Um, and I, you know, I was an analyst professionally, you know, first, but I was a gamer before I was an analyst. So I, I just like, oh, whoa, that's how that works, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think it's best if some, the analogy I use is, is, um, is a bump is volleyball and I don't play volleyball, but like, I just, I think it's a funny analogy where it's like, it's, it's bump set and spike. Right. And that basically like, I think that the, the bump really needs to come from data where it's like, there's a whole bunch of unstructured information. It can be an analyst, it can be a community manager, it can be any sort of form of unstructured data to say like, hey, every, sorry, I'm not gonna do the, I, we're, I'm not gonna do the, 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 the physical, but you get it. The bump is, hey, like we're seeing all this interesting information about how players are reacting to something. And I thought that this was fascinating given what we talked about with our strategy. And the set is more like production, a little bit of product management to say, 
here's what we would want to do with that information. Here's how many resources we would need to do it. Here's how much time you have. And then the spike is really the design, which is to say, here's how we're going to do it. And so I, I think that basically like the role of the analytics team and analytics professionals in, in games, I, I, I feel like there's a lot to it, right? They can build a better quantitative culture. They can build a testing culture. Like there's all kinds of stuff that I, I'm learning even more about at Rec Room about, you know, what's the best way for data scientists to sort of add business value and sort of relentlessly push the team to be better. And I, I think that there, all of that is there. And I think that basically like that can take many forms, but I, I, I saying that you're data driven or that you're data informed or is really fundamentally about like harnessing the natural curiosity that we all have about that ocean of data and then sort of taking it to the game team and sort of having conversations to say, what, what are we gonna do about this? You know, is this a strategic problem that we wanna solve? Um, and you know, is like, how, how actionable is this thing? I think the second part of, you know, the role of analytics, of course, is also just to sort of measure the success, you know, of, mm -hmm. of different initiatives. And that's where the loop comes in, where it's like, okay, we took all this information, we put together a plan, you know, we validated it, we built it, we shipped it, we're live operating it, how's it doing? And that's where, you know, you have to sort of filter it back both through the ocean of unstructured data that everybody has access to, but also in that, that, that mechanism that you said, which is basically sort of a product person asking the analyst, Hey, like we want, really wanted to do X, like did, did this work? You know, where are we falling short? What do we do next? And, and that sort of virtuous cycle is um, it's pretty common now, but I, I still love it. I still find a lot of joy in, in executing it. Here's another one for, for analytics. Um, everyone likes to talk about game economy and how game economy touches every aspect. And, you know, if your game economy goes awry, it can mess everything up. But what sort of roles does analytics play? And like, how do you know if your game economy is messed up? Or like, what are the things you should be watching for of like the currency and, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's a, you know, I, I think I don't really think that anybody, you know, like we've all sort of developed different approaches to this. It, it's going to be a never ending cycle, right, of working on game projects and interactive projects and getting better at understanding virtual economies. And now virtual economies are having more and more real world value. And this is, I, I, I you know, I don't think anybody's sort of, or at least I certainly haven't felt like I answered this problem. But I do have like a couple of tools that I think are really valuable. And like I, I mentioned this earlier, which is to say that like one of your guardrails has to be about aggregate participation in, in the economy. And that basically like you can be operating off of game, like business KPIs, you can be operating off of like complex behavioral KPIs, but um, a lot of those KPIs are based on averages. A lot of those KPIs are sort of divorced from some of the economic context that lead to them. So like, for example, you know, if, if you're uh, motivating a whole bunch of players uh, with hard currency as rewards, theoretically, you know, only a handful of players would get those rewards and only a handful of players would ever sort of get sourced an amount of virtual currency that, um, you know, is, is enough that you would need to be worried about. And I, I think we all spend a lot of time worrying about that, but I think the reality is um, the what really matters is are they, are players still in the system when they get what they want, right? If players spend a lot of time hunting for virtual currency or building things that reward them virtual currency or, you know, fighting, once they get it, do they actually have a reason to play? And one of the easiest ways that I think you can manage that and monitor that in analytics is it's not like rocket science, but it's also like not super basic either. It's about, and this is, you know, it, it, it's about moving from averages to distributions, right? It's about moving from averages to percentiles. It's about understanding, you know, like this is a cliche, but like you operate a live service for 100% of your players. You don't operate it. Even if your money comes from a certain group or even if the social and the engagement and the community sentiment, like if, if you're like most businesses like don't operate off of like crazy rocket ship growth all the time forever, and so like, you can't, it's not responsible for you to say, ah, eh, 5% of your audience, they were free to play. Like, we're not gonna care about them. That will come back to bite you if you don't think about it in a sustainable way. So, so really just sort of like, 
the role of analytics in game economy management to sum it up should be about painting a clear picture of 100% of your customers and 100% of your potential customers. And again, I know it's cliche, but like, I, I really feel like that's as far as I've gotten in terms of like a rock solid rule for, for operating. Do you think that you should, and, and we're about to get into segmentation, so it's going to be fun, cool. but um, do you think it's important to segment players when doing analytics as well? So like, players that do xyz mm -hmm. i want to look at how they behave in the game and their currency and stuff players that do something else i should look at that whereas if i look at them combined together i might get the wrong picture so that last thing you said is 100 percent the case right that basically like great game experiences um, have diverse behaviors associated with them um, and you want to make sure that you're actually sort of sketching out those behaviors and having a good like behavioral hypothesis for how you would measure a segment is really important. And that's where like the design and product loop works really well, where it's like, I, I don't need you to worry about how we're going to measure it. I just need you to just say like, this is a phenomenon that I'm seeing or I'm playing or I want to understand is true. You know, and are players hoarding currency in advance of the next event? Are players trying out, you know, B and C tier characters in their combat? Are players, you know, turning their social activity into something that they're actually looking forward to and preparing for? All of these things. And it's like, okay, we'll figure out how to measure it. We'll come back and say, is this a sufficient picture to sort of tell you if this is real or not? So at the end of the day, you do that over and over again and you develop segmentation. On the other hand, I, I'm actually, I'd love to know what you think about this, but like, is the role of evolving a live service about being all things to all people? Or is it about, is it about telling a story to people who can share that story? And I'm, I, I want to do both, but as I've, especially coming to Rec Room, where like social is the most important, social is more important than monetization. It's more important than, you know, everything. Like we're basically having something that you can share with others is what creates value in the ecosystem. And I actually even think that was true in my, my previous life in, in, in RPG land too. And so, how do you avoid a rock solid segmentation strategy from becoming a way of balkanizing your community and inhibiting your ability to do really, really cool stuff for as many people as possible, like a Travis Scott Fortnite concert? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think that I think that there's a limit and it's, but I, like I said, I, I'd be curious to know what you think about it because it's not, I don't feel like it's settled for me. So I think when I think about segmentation, and I, I'm thinking about it with my user-wise live ops. Everything that we do is built around segmentation and, and drive monetization. But I'm also thinking about it from my experience as a player of a lot of games. Um, and so I think if I kind of blend those two together, where my ideal comfort level would be, and I'm not saying that this is the mm. best thing to do, um, but uh, and uh, so something happened to me as a player, and I don't know if this was designed. I know how I would design it in user wise. And I think it would be perfectly, and it could have just been like a spoof of, of right. random luck. But uh, I did a special episode with uh, my buddy, David Molnar, where we just like uh, played a bunch of wild rift. And then we kind of broke down the live ups that we had in there. Um, and as I was playing wild rift, well, one, I was reminded why I've played thousands of hours of league of legends and I had to uninstall that app, but um as I was playing, uh, at one point in time, I had a bunch of currency. So I was like, I'm going to buy a new champion. And I was feeling a little bit trolly that day. So I decided to buy Teemo um, because I wanted to mess people up with bombs and blinds. Um, and I bought Teemo. And immediately after buying Teemo, I went like 18 and three. Like I just tore it up. Like I felt amazing, just destroyed everyone. I got MVP on the team, I got an S rating. And immediately after that, I got a, an offer to buy a Timo skin. Now, I don't even remember if I bought it or not. Yeah. Um, but to me, like, that was a perfect time. Like, if you're going to sell me a Timo skin, it, it's right after I, like, just did amazing on Timo because I want to strut my stuff. Um, and, and to me, I think that's where I could do something. Like, you could create a segment of Timo players or maybe players that recently bought Timo. And then you have a triggered action of if they got an S rating or higher or something like they did really well, then they get this pop up for a special offer that they've kind of like unlocked or something. 
um, you know, emotionally, physically. Now, I don't actually know how much revenue that's going to drive because that could be a very small number of players that actually like get into there. And so that that's kind of the balance where you have to do some analytics to figure out like what's in there. But, you know, to me, that felt really good as a player because it was like personalized, right. but also meaningful. Um, and so I think if you can find a way to blend those two together, that would be, in my opinion, like the best way to do it. Makes it makes perfect sense. Yeah, this is this is where I'm I'm headed as well in terms of thinking about it, which is to say that like, and this is more high level cliche. I, I apologize. It's, it's like good segmentation is is about the journey and not about the destination, right? And so what I mean by that is that your experience onboarding into being the perfect candidate for a Timo skin, it your game experience doesn't end after you purchase it but your journey was one that was a perfect fit for it. And so what I, what I think is like for each incoming cohort of players experiencing a game, like, sorry, I'm just on an analogy train today, but like, Love it. <laughs> like, like, okay, I enter League of Legends. There is a party going on all the way out at the end of the user life cycle, right? Where everybody knows the meta, people are excited. They have agency in what the game is. They yell at the devs. They, they like, it's, it's a party, right? Yep. We love that party. Live ops is that party. It's sort of the, the main factor behind, you know, one of the biggest growth engines and games in the last 10, 15 years, but a new player is not part of that party. Right. And I believe that the role of segmentation is to optimize the journey to join that party, shorten the journey to that party, personalize the journey to that party you know, engage and monetize the, the journey of that party. And so basically, like, I, I think the real question is, like, how thoroughly and concretely and um, uh, intentionally was that journey that you had designed? Um, or is it sort of the output of some, like, incredible machine learning engine? And I think that basically, like, that's where I'm at is to say that, like, I, I want it to be the latter. I think that's the most sustainable <laughs> way to run a business, but I don't think that's actually a huge part of how segmentation succeeds at scale. I think that designing really, really smart contextual interventions and short circuiting some of the long and circuitous things that are no longer necessary for a new player three, four, eight, five years out to join the party, that is the actual role. But I, but I am also increasingly of the mind that once you're at the party, um, segmentation does not take on that role and that you actually wanna be able to do your live ops elder storytelling to the entire party rather than to sort of certain. And again, it's like, it's more complicated than that, I'm sure. But like, that's sort of where I'm at. I think, you know, as you're kind of talking through, it reminded me of another use case for segmentation that I think is key. So, you know, I was recently talking to a, a customer or potential customer for UserWise that um, they're using Lean Plum. Right. Um, and I would say for most of their use cases, they're like kind of covered. But um, where Lean Plum was failing is that, they were trying to do re-engagement campaigns because it's like a game that's been around for a while. Um, and they're, they've got all these like churned or semi-churned users and they really wanted to design kind of like the perfect comeback campaign. Um, and they couldn't do that because of how segmentation was like cross filtered and stuff. And so like they'd come back in and instead of getting this like perfectly designed come back, like remember the good times, the golden moments and stuff. They were intertwined with all the existing like elder game, meta, live ops stuff that's like already in yes. there. And it was like yes. poisoning the experience. Whereas totally. like, you know, you want to remind these players like, what's the good time like? Like Clash of Clans, um, they introduced this little like uh, cart thing. So like when you get raided, it like stores up stuff. So if you don't play Clash of Clans for a while, you come back like 30 days later, you've got like, 14 million gold and like all this max stuff. And it's like, Oh, I can like do some upgrades. Like you, you remember the good times and like when, when it's, and it, it's, it brings you back in a little bit. Um, and so I think that's what they were trying to do, but they couldn't because of how like lean plum was working. But I think segmentation can work really well for those types of campaigns too, because you totally. almost want to like separate out these players to design the perfect player experience. And eventually you do want to merge them into everyone else. But for a little while, you might need to separate them. And that's where segmentation can be really key, I think. I, I think so, too. The, the folks at Scopely are just extraordinary at this. And it was something that I learned a lot from them at. And just to say that, like, how can you run, like, a really, really efficient live ops, you know, organization and grow KPIs week over week forever, you know, always move things up and to the right without sort of 
you know, sacrificing like some massive churn, you know, at the elder game. And I think that what you're talking about specifically is like something that, like I said, but I, it's like, it was based off of, you know, great pieces of tech and great, you know, humans, but, but it ultimately was not, um, it ultimately was a, a system that had a lot of design and a lot of craftsmanship to it. Um, and anything that was not well crafted would not work, and anything that was well crafted would tend to work better. And so I, I think basically we're still scratching the surface of how to be at like the level of mass market tech platforms and social media companies, like all the things that they do with reengagement and segmentation. Like I still think games are in a in a building phase where they yeah. don't they haven't achieved best practices at the level of some of those larger products. And that's actually it's like that's like one of my bucket list things in my career <laughs> is like how can we run a service for 500 million people and do so sustainably. Like that scale is something that I, I, I am specifically really excited about Rec Room about. Yeah, no, I, I haven't seen any game that has a TikTok or Instagram algorithm to like get players right. back and keep them engaged and stuff. Um, even, you know, Supercell claims they have these amazing machine learning algorithms. I think they're stupid. Like they give me like cards that I've never even played in any deck. It's like, why would you want me to buy that? I would never buy that. I think, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, I think that basically like the, 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 you know, they're, they're one of the best, but I think that basically like one of the things that you realize, even if you're running, I mean, I, I obviously don't know much about Supercell. I never, you know, worked on any of their games, but like at the end of the day, those free to play products are, optimizing their elder game on behalf of a relatively small number of people. Yeah. And there's amazing benefits to that in terms of that quote unquote storytelling. But what you're talking about with regards to really intelligent kick-ass segmentation, mm -hmm. you need a hundred million people and a ton of training and the smartest people in the world. And we're, we're all getting there in games in my opinion, but I don't, I don't think we've gotten there yet. Yeah, totally. Um, I am curious, like, Scopely was amazing. Like, did you learn anything there of like how they do, segmentation and you, maybe this isn't scope play I'll, I'll say it could be any anyone that you've worked with in the past but like what are good ways to like actually group segments together like is it the cohort days are there player levels like what have you found actually works well you know i, I think i should say that i i worked in the rpg and midcourt division at scopely and there's a center of excellence in forex and there's a center of excellence in you know social PVP games and there's a center of excellence in casual games. So it's like, I didn't learn everything in only two years, but in RPG land, like the main thing I learned from all those people there was about uh, cohorts, install cohorts and your average age of the player. And like my whole analogy about the party, like it really is about that, which is to say that like, how are you building a product that enters year three, year four, year five, year six, and still provides a viable on-ramp and good unit economics on LTV minus CAC without sacrificing sort of relentless optimization at the far end of the game. So that basically to say like, you know, what, what kinds of annual refreshes are you doing and how are you, forget about making the perfect decision, how are you not making the wrong decision with your feature development teams and just making sure that you have, you take high percentage shots and make the game sort of on-ramp the game better for players coming in um, from a business perspective um, and also just like never yield an inch on how to create sort of the fully optimized elder community that I think most of Scopus Scop Live games are known for. So that, that was the main thing I learned about segmentation. It was about delineating between a player who is super, super elder, a player who is super elder, a player who's regular elder, a player who's on their way to being elder. Um, yeah, that those, the new player experience is always really challenging. And I don't, I don't know if I have like a long list of projects that I've tried and mostly failed, but I, I think everybody's sort of in that boat. And so I think that, yeah. you know, some like Marvel Strike Force, I know this has been extraordinary at that over the years. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's that's sort of my my main experience with how what like the best practices on segmentation look like. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about marketing and pre-install efforts, but I don't know that we have time, but I do want to cover um, just some monetization stuff uh, sure. real quick before we end. Um, so I think there's been some really kind of really aggressive monetization tools um, and I'm, you know, curious what your take on things like loot boxes, rotating shops, events, gotchas, social pressure. Um, like, what's your take on monetization where we're at, where we maybe should be going? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Which is to say that a lot of free-to-play mobile projects have fallen deep, deep, deep into the arms race, right? In terms of 
sky high acquisition costs and that these mechanics sort of came into fashion in, as a way of combating that arms race and winning. And, you know, not, this is, uh, there's a lot of good 4X games out there, but like, and there's a lot of excellence in, you know, the way that they were run, but like, I don't know, like I kind of got tired of Game of War after a while and uh, back in like eight years ago. And I, I think that basically like that being like the apotheosis of great, like super hardcore aggressive monetization to the detriment of a lot else. Like, I think that everybody sort of started going down the long road of saying like, you know, this is probably not sustainable. And I think that basically a lot of my time at Star Wars and a lot of my time um, at Scopely was about trying to find a way to get off that path where it's like, we're still running a business, but we can't burn players. Um, you, you, like, you, 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 if you, if you do something to drive a player away, you have lost and you have yeah. to sit around losing forever. Um, <laughs> because you're, you're probably not going to get fired, but you are going to get like, you are going to be in a situation where it's like, man, we really shouldn't have done that. And so I think that like, I know that's like kind of obvious, but I, I think basically like the net effect of all of that has been that people have thrown out most of the monetization mechanics that have existed, you know, in mass market products. And I think that, you know, you look at the rise of the battle pass in mass market products and you think, okay, this is a sustainable monetization mechanic. And it's true in that it's somewhat sustainable in terms of the price that's being charged, but is it sustainable in terms of how much content that you have to create? Is it sustainable in every, every type of genre ever? Um, is it sustainable as more and more live projects become more powered by the players themselves, whether it's through UGC or through like decentralization, like all, all of these trends that are happening, like I think that I basically I you know I I feel like it's important to understand how these mechanics work and what they do with precision because I think that they will be really valuable um, in the future in a in a more player friendly more sustainable way and I think that I'm I'm trying to figure out how to sort of like keep those best practices alive lest we sort of run into a situation where we are all running pretty you know, suboptimal or, you know, semi-sustainable yeah. businesses. So I, I, I think I'll always be a scholar of those kinds of mechanics, even if Rec Room is not a good fit for any of them, or even if, you know, uh, what we're doing in UGC will probably not integrate those types of mechanics. But I, I just, I always want to, you know, keep, keep thinking about them and keep thinking about ways to sort of resurrect them. Sorry, and this is, there's one other element to this, which is to say that, like, if you figure out uh, really in like, if you figure out a really powerful way of monetizing your game, then you don't have to figure out 17 different ways of monetizing your game. I really am a big yeah. fan of like not nickel and diming the players and saying, giving them transparency and saying, this is what we're selling. This is how our business works. Yep. If you nail that and you are ruthless about that, then you don't have to monetize everything else and you can avoid the malaise that sort of takes hold when everything is monetized. So that that's sort of, that's why I wanna keep thinking about aggressive monetization mechanics because like maybe you, you use one and then you don't have to ruin the rest of your game. Like that's yeah. that's something that I think is gonna be really important for folks as they think about like, not just money, but scale. Like how can you make a great game for 10 million, 50 million, 100 billion people? That's amazing. I love it. Well, I do have one final question for you because it is the Master and Retention Podcast. And that is, you know, what's one tip, trick, or lesson you've learned over the years to help keep your players playing for longer? How do you keep them retained? I think, man, I, the one thing I love talking about is the, um, you know, the Bethesda moment, right? The moment when you exit the vault or the moment when you sort of walk up on the mountain and you see everything in front of you and just sort of the grand aspiration. I used to call it the off Kotla moment from Baldur's Gate 2, but nobody knew what I was talking about. So uh, it, the idea is like those first impressions, they can apply to your game and they can apply to features. And we like living in live ops land, we think it's important to ship quickly. It's important to iterate. And sometimes like Nintendo, Blizzard, Polish, whatever is not everybody's top priority, but sometimes you have to switch lens from your, you know, your, your Terminator live ops KPI lens to like, what is the very first impression this feature is going to make on the player? And I'm not talking about the tutorial. I'm not talking about you telling them how to use the feature. I'm talking about boom, nonverbal. Wow. I'm going to spend months of my life working on this. And I would overinvest in those areas and cut rigorously from things that didn't contribute to that. And I think that that's like 
whenever we're, I'm working on a new feature with a team, I probably say that over and over again to say like, if this doesn't kill you in terms of like, wow, this is absolutely you know awesome and I didn't see it coming and it's huge and aspirational. I think when I'm looking at high risk features and trying to hit retention and trying to inflect that, I just I, I try to go all in on that. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Sam. If folks do have you know any questions for you or about Rec Room or anything like that, is there a good way for them to get in contact with you? Yeah, of course. You know, on my on my LinkedIn, Sam Abbott, I, I love talking about UGC and Rec Room's really an amazing culture and sort of shameless plug. Like we're growing like crazy and we're hiring all <laughs> different types of disciplines. So if you want to, you know, work on live ops, great. If you want to make features, great. If you want to be a server dev, great. If you want to do trust and safety, awesome. Like we're we're, we're really growing quickly and tackling a million different challenges. And I, I, like I said, the UGC, I think it's the most interesting thing going on right now. And like, I, I know that, I know there's a lot of Web3 stuff going on. I mean, it's not completely unrelated. Um, I love RPGs with all my heart and I left them to go tackle this because I think it is the future. And so I, yeah, that's, that would be something I would always be happy to get about with anybody. That's awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Tom.